So uh, I'm actually a lecturer at PNCA here in Portland, and I teach on Thursday nights. And uh, my students allowed me to skip class and come here for credit. Um, so we got to give them a little shout out. I really appreciate that. Um, thanks, students. Um, so uh, my other job is I'm the outreach coordinator for the Center for Genomic Astronomy. And we're a research organization that looks at the genomes and the biotechnologies that make up the human food systems on planet Earth. And what I want to tell you about tonight is how to eat a GMO. And that might seem intuitive. You put it in your mouth, you chew it, and you digest it, or you don't digest it. Um, the problem with that is we've been doing that um, passively for a few decades, and I want you to do that actively. I want you essentially to be beta testers for this emerging technology. So one way of being a beta tester for GMOs is to create recipes for foods that don't quite exist yet or are on the fringe. So I've created four uh, sections, and we have recipes for each. Vanishing foods, not yet foods, forgotten foods, and unavailable foods. So the first section is vanishing foods. I live in India half the year, and when I was there last, we went to the markets and we found that there were eight different cultivars of eggplants in the markets. Here they are. And you can see that uh, humans have been hacking the hell out of this genome for uh, many, many centuries. There's all different kinds of shapes, colors, sizes, and textures. And taste matters and cultures matter, but Monsanto didn't seem to get that. When they tried to put the first uh, transgenic organism into the food chain in India, they picked eggplant, which everyone eats. I would have, uh, if I had been uh, consulting for them, suggested they pick something that was an acquired taste, like uh, bitter gourd. So what we did um, is we created a baseline research to say, OK, here are the cultivars that exist in terms of eggplants in India. Let's make a, b a bunch of recipes that take into account those cultivars. So in the future, when they're replaced, we'll know that they're missing. And those were the recipes. Now, also this year, the first Taco Bell opened up in uh, India. It was totally mobbed for the first two months. It was in the biggest mall in South Asia. And this just points to the fact that the world is much more complex than we give it credit for. And when you change people's tastes, you change their assumptions and their expectations. Uh, the second uh, type of food is the not yet foods. So you may have heard that the US FDA is about to approve a transgenic salmon. Have you heard of this? Grows double as fast. I don't know how you feel about it. But you can be a beta tester. You don't need to wait for the US FDA to approve that. We already have these things called glowfish. And they're transgenic fish that are available at your aquarium. Now, the reason that they're there is because zebrafish are a model species in biology. So they've been being hacked by scientists for many decades. You can go and get one yourself today. So we've made a number of recipes for these. So you don't have to wait for approval from the government to try these transgenic fish if you're interested. What's really interesting about this is that they've been existing in science labs. And all of a sudden, one guy had a really good marketing strategy, which was to make them available to the public. And we think that's really innovative. And we're building on his innovation by cooking with them. Um, I don't know how happy he is about that, but I want to ask you about how happy you are with this, these recipes. So if you're all for uh, transgenic foods, you'll love my sushi rolls. If you don't like my glowing sushi rolls, you may want to tell the US FDA to hold off on that transgenic salmon. The decision is up to you. You're no longer passive. You're active in this process. OK, what about forgotten foods? So we see here uh, a piece from the BBC's website, which is no longer available, which is, a, is of the fish tomato. The fish tomato is a tomato with a gene inserted uh, with a cold tolerant gene from a fish. And a lot of historians of biotechnology don't think this exists. Well, my students in India were helping with research, and we uh, co-created a recipe called Vegetarian Booyah Base, which calls for the fish tomato. And in our research, we found documents that proved that this very much did exist. This brings up really important questions. Is the fish tomato vegetarian? Is it an animal? Is it a plant? We don't know. Um, but uh, it's important to eat this and taste this and find out. The problem is we can't because both the genome and the data of, uh, that came out of the research vanished in a cloud of confidential business information and corporate uh, appropriation. Uh, and th the issue here is if we don't have this data, we're not doing science. Science is about verifiability and repeatability. So we need to stop calling the people who don't give us data scientists. They're not scientists. They're just biohackers like me and you. Until they make their data public, we should not call them scientists. OK, the last section is unavailable foods. You probably know this, but all over the world, transgenic organisms are being created on almost a daily basis. So this is an example from Poland. It's a cucumber. You can see the PL, which means Poland. So it's not only the US. The EU is also promoting a lot of these organisms. So my idea is like, well, what does it mean to cook with this sweet cucumber? Let's make a recipe called Hyper Sweet and Sour Pickles. Um, when we brine the cucumber, does it retain its sweetness? Is the point of this cucumber to feed more sugar to, into the industrial food chain? We don't know until we taste it, and we don't know until we make recipes. So there's databases for both the US and the EU that you can tap into. 
happen to and make your own recipes and re write to and request from the companies uh, examples of their genome so you can cook with them. So I hope you join me in becoming a biohacker and genomic astronomer so that you can cook with interesting organisms that most cooks don't have um, access to. And I want to thank my students in India from the um, Shristi School of Art, Design, and Technology who really helped me initially with this research and did amazing research. They even showed up a few PhD people uh, at schools to uh, remain unnamed. And uh, if you're interested in contributing recipes to our forthcoming cookbook, please contact us. And remember, we have always been biohackers. We should continue to be, and we shouldn't leave that in the hands of the few. Thank you.